Hello! Welcome to Sleep Money, your guide to the business and finance news of the week. I'm Felix Salmon of Axios. I'm here with Elizabeth Spires of New York Times and places like that. Hello. And very excitingly, we are here with Lizzie O'Leary of a great podcast on Slate called What Next TBD. TBD stands for Business to Tech and Science. No, it stands for To Be Determined. It's a placeholder name. As in the future name. will be determined. You have literally had a placeholder name for your podcast. No, since it's, it launched about, you. it's about the future. It's about the future. Okay, listen to it. And the main thing is that she's awesome, brilliant, fantastic, and wonderful. We are going to have you on the show to talk about electric vehicles and about Hunterbrook and about wine and in the Slate Plus about Disney. It's all coming up on Slate Money. Slate Money is brought to you this week by Progressive Insurance. And I know you listen to podcasts because you're listening to this one. You might listen to true crime or comedy or celebrity interviews or news. Whatever you listen to, it's up to you. And guess what? Now you can call the shots on your auto insurance, too, with the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. It works just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance, and they'll show you coverage options that fit your budget. Get your quote today at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. When we made our McDonald's spicy chicken McNuggets, you were praise hands emoji. Then we ran out and you were streaming tears emoji. Now they're back, so you can be grinning face with sweat emoji. Order ahead on the McDonald's app. And get money mouth face emoji with two orders of crispy, irresistible 10-piece McNuggets. Spicy or classic for just $6. Limited time only. Prices and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer. Single item at regular price. Let's start off by talking about electric vehicles because some of the sheen seems to have been taken off the asset class. I get this feeling that everyone thought this was going to be a revolution and it turns out to be a revolution but a much slower revolution than people thought. Lizzie, do you have an EV? Do you want an EV? I don't have an EV. I want an EV, although I actually, perhaps germane to this conversation, think a plug-in hybrid is probably a better way to go, especially if you live in a dense place like New York City. My brother has one, though. He has one of the Hyundais. The Hyundais, by the way, saw 62% growth in EV sales um, year on year in the first quarter. And notwithstanding Hyundai having 62% growth, the entire EV asset class grew at an anemic 2% or so, mainly because Tesla sales and Tesla being by far the biggest EV manufacturer in the United States, not in the world, but in the United States, went down for the first time ever year on year by about 8%. And now everyone's like, oh, shit, Ford has put off a couple of big EV launches until sort of 2027. A lot of the investment that people were front loading into EVs is now people are saying, well, we should wait until the infrastructure is here. And everyone seems to be convinced that it's going to happen. It's just probably not going to happen as quickly as we had anticipated. Yeah, I think part of it, too, is that it's not going to happen how we anticipated. I think it's going to really depend on people buying hybrids first, because there's still a lot of trepidation about buying anything that you have to plug in and find a plug for. I think Elizabeth's totally right. The other thing that I think is important here is the way the infrastructure is front loaded really to accommodate Tesla because they were the first mover, because they advertised these great big batteries so you could have a one for one swap. That's not necessarily what you need if you are doing kind of generic American driving, which is about 40 miles a day, you don't actually need a battery that can take you 300 miles, although we can quibble with that since Tesla inflated its own battery power. So yeah, this is super interesting that like, in theory, the plug in hybrid is an amazing thing, because you never need to gas it up if you use it as most Americans use their cars. And if you have a way of recharging it at home, then You drive around all day, you come back, you plug it in, it's fully charged in the morning, you drive around all day and rinse and repeat. And 
The engine just kind of sits there in case of emergency. It is a very big and heavy and expensive, like in case of emergency, backup. But it's, it's, it's not peace as of big mind. and heavy as a great big Rivian or Tesla battery, though. It, that that is true, and the sheer weight and quantity of batteries that the, the luxury car manufacturers are putting into their EVs is completely insane. But one of the super interesting things that we discover empirically when we look at people who own plug-in hybrids is that an absolutely enormous number of them, even if they have a charging station at home, never plug them in and they just use them like normal gas cars. And you're like, really? Why? Really? I know. I think this is worth it's worth talking about the difference between a Tesla owner and other people who own hybrids because the Tesla customer is, is pretty distinct and their motivations for buying a Tesla are not exactly the same as, say, the person who buys a Prius. So for what you're talking about, it doesn't really surprise me that the hybrid owners are not necessarily plugging in all the time because I think they view the hybrids as a way to kind of save money on gas, but they're not necessarily fully EV converts. But they're not saving money on gas because they never plug it in, so the battery never has any charge. Well, but they have the option to. Right. And in their minds, <laughs> it's the same thing. It would make sense if you used it and I think this is the optimal way to use a plug-in hybrid, you use your battery for school drop-off, grocery run, the kind of normal driving that most people do. And then if you need to take a you know, 200-mile road trip, then you use some gas. Right. That's exactly what they're designed for. And it's partly because of this whole range anxiety thing that really grew up in the early days of EVs when there were very few charging stations. And there still are like many fewer charging stations than there need to be in order to assuage the range anxiety. And so, yeah, so car manufacturers started putting huge amounts of range in the car, loading them up with very expensive and, you know, environmentally damaging batteries to try and assuage this range anxiety because they're just on, it's just, much more time consuming and difficult and pain in the ass to you know, refuel an EV, to recharge an EV than it is to refuel a, a gas car. Add to that the fact that in order to refuel a gas car, you have to go to a petrol station, which means there's a lot of demand for such things. With most EVs, people refuel them, recharge them at home, which means there's just never going to be the same kind of demand for the refueling stations, the recharging stations, and therefore you're never going to be able to support as many and they're not going to be as ubiquitous. Unless you had, and I think the the federal government is starting to realize this, slightly different incentives. So, right, let's say you have EV charging stations in an apartment building garage, right? Like, yeah, most, that's most department where the building infrastructure starts to make sense. Garages do have them. Like that's the whole point, right? Everyone wants charging where they live, where they park the car. And I think that's coming. And ag and again, that is 99% of the use case. If you have charging where you live, then nearly all the time you're fine. But then everyone always has this idea, but what if I want to go away for days on end and where am I going to recharge? And that little 1% use case of what if drives so much of the actual purchasing decision. Well, it's also driven the policy for the last 10 years. It's driven the manufacturers just loading up the cars with range, yeah. So, Lizzie, since you're the EV expert here, why is <laughs> Tesla doing so much worse than the sector overall? Well, I think there are multiple factors there, one of which is Tesla has over-promised in some of the sort of key things, right? They've overpromised in terms of their range. They have done things like divert customer complaints to like fake call centers. There's some sort of, I think what we could qualify as the hinky bucket, right? Like weird stuff. But the other thing is also they're expensive, right? Uh, Elizabeth, you were talking about the specifics of an EV customer, especially a Tesla customer. That's a pretty high end purchase. And at some point, you're going to run out of people who are going to pay that much money for an electric well, car. And it's weird because Tesla, more than anyone else, has been discounting its cars and it's been bringing down, down its prices. But I think a couple of very it's still Tesla, a luxury product. It's, it's still a luxury ish project. But yeah. if you get into the most popular Tesla vehicle, which is the Model 3, 
it doesn't feel particularly luxurious. So that's one problem is you feel like, why would I pay a luxury car price for something that doesn't feel like a luxury car, except for when I press the accelerator pedal. And this is the one thing that everyone loves about EVs is they have an amazing acceleration. But put that to one side. There are a couple of very Tesla-specific things that have happened. The first thing is that, you know, Elon Musk went red pill. Well, right. I was going to say, there's there's the Elon factor. There's the Elon factor, which I don't think, which given that if you look at where EVs are sold, it's overwhelmingly in blue states. There, there's something, I, it's dumb and it shouldn't be this way, but they have this kind of flavor of liberal to them, EVs in general. So the minute that Elon Musk becomes this kind of boogeyman to the left, people don't want to give him money by buying Teslas. The other thing that we should probably mention is that three years ago, Teslas were two or three years ahead of all other EVs. They really had an amazing head start and Teslas were beyond a doubt the best EVs on the market. And really Teslas kind of managed to go nowhere in those two or three years. The Model 3 is basically, you know, it's basically the same now as it was when it was launched. They have the only thing they've launched since then is this dumbass Cybertruck of which, you know, three have been sold and is just like not an important or interesting entrance in, into the car universe. So Tesla's been treading water in terms of its product while everyone else has been getting actually good. And so now when you're shopping for an EV, you actually have a choice. So Tesla doesn't have the overwhelming majority of buyers anymore. Now you can get perfectly good EVs from any number of different manufacturers. So it kind of makes sense that they're going to be losing market share. So also, I you know, before we started taping, I looked up demographics for the typical Tesla buyer. They're sort of predictably exactly who you would think would buy a Tesla. You know, the buyers are 81% white, they're 74% male, the most common job occupation is software engineer, and they typically make 150 k or more. In terms of politics, they're 38% Democrat, 30% Republican, they're kind of split there. But they also all report that part of the appeal of the Tesla or the biggest appeal of the Tesla is style and performance. So you look at something like a Cybertruck launch that's widely made fun of because there are so many problems with it. And it feels like they're not intentionally, but throwing away their primary appeal to that demographic. Yeah, if you want style and performance, and you're making 150 grand a year, there's a lot of you're not high performance, buy that stylish looks like EVs. my child's dinner plates. Yeah, you, well, you're not going to. Okay, number one, you're not going to buy a, style, a, a Cybertruck, but number two, you're not even going to buy like a Model Three, right? You know, you you might spend a fortune and buy like a Porsche Taycan or something, you know, or you might buy a Ford Mackie or you might be, a, or you might be just like a good old middle American. Remember that half of the vehicles sold in America are trucks and you'd buy a Ford Lightning, you know, which is an amazing vehicle or a Rivian R1T. There's a lot of really good vehicles out there. So like Tesla's had the market to itself for so long, I think it's just suddenly woken up and gone, oh shit, we have competition now. I also think part of the Tesla market was just the cool sports car market and not necessarily people who were specifically, you know, wanted an electric car. There was just a period where that was the cool new thing. And then and I think it's born thin. But I do think that the long term trend, if you look internationally, we're at this point now where somewhere in the region of 10%, sometimes it's 7 sometimes it's 15 but in that kind of neighborhood, in Norway, it's like half of new cars are EVs. The broad trend is up and to the right. And I think the long-term long prognosis for like, when are we going to get to the point when 90% of new vehicles are electric? Like, I don't think that date has actually been pushed back that far. It's just like the the curve of adoption is going to be a little bit weirder. Well, and I think the the sort of tweaks to US subsidy policy less focused on ginormous battery might actually help drag people along. The the one thing that would really help drive EV adoption in the United States, and I think we've talked about this on the show in the past, is if we allowed or at least didn't punish Chinese imports. The biggest EV manufacturer in the world is BYD. They make some amazing EVs. Various other Chinese companies do as well. I mean, Polestar 
which is a pretty swanky EV is Chinese owned, but not, you know. So um, American companies are making EVs in China. So like, in theory, there's no reason why we shouldn't be getting BYDs in the United States. But politically, I think that's just a non-starter. And the problem with it being a non-starter is that exactly what you're saying, Lizzie, is that the cars are just too fucking expensive. And like, so long as the average EV is forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000, they are just not going to be the majority of cars sold. So now the race is on to get rival electric cars onto the market. But Britain is way ahead of the world with its plug-in car project. Are you selling a little or a lot? Shopify will help you either way. It is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business, from launching your online store to opening up a brick and mortar place to, oh my God, I'm going public on the stock market. Whether you're selling scented soap or outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell everywhere. And they have an in-person POS system so that you're selling online, in-person. It's all integrated into Shopify. They power 10% of all e-commerce in the United States. And their award-winning help is there to support your success every step of the way. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash money, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash money now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash money. When it comes to your finances, go for the credit card that's always there for you. With 24-7 US-based live customer service from Discover, everyone has the option to talk to a real person anytime, day or night. Yep, that means no more waiting for, quote, normal business hours just to get a hold of someone. We're talking real service from real people whenever you need it. Get the customer service you deserve with Discover. Limitations apply. See terms at discover.com slash credit card. I think we should do the thing that journalists love to do more than anything else in the world, which is talk about journalism. Elizabeth, you are, you've been looking into this. Who or what is a Hunter Brook? So Hunter Brook is, I think as Matt Levine puts it, a newspaper that's also a hedge fund. So it's a, a hedge fund that basically has a, a buy-side research arm that they're calling a newspaper and staffing with journalists so that they can put out stories about companies that they're targeting on a short selling basis. And the idea is that the newspaper will produce these stories that talk about why the companies suck. And then the research firm will trade on them. And this is not insider trading in theory, because the journalistic arm is just using publicly available information. Yeah, I'm just going to come out here and say put the in theory aside, it is not insider trading. They are Okay, trading. but what if they publish an investigation? They don't. They are not going to publish investigations in the way that you understand investigations with like confidential sources, insider sources. What they say they are doing is what they call OSINT, open source intelligence. They are using public information to report their stories. They are not doing the thing that journalists have historically been very good at, which is find insiders, take them out for drinks, find inside information and that kind of stuff. They are not breaking news in that sense. They are uncovering things that are kind of out in the open, but no one has connected the dots. That is what they say they are doing. Now, you are absolutely right. If they did investigations and had confidential sources inside companies and that kind of thing, that would be arguably illegal, and they're being very careful not to do that. I'm just going off what uh, Nathaniel Horwitz said to the FT, which was, rather than tying, trying to predict or react to events, we time trades on news we break ourselves. I totally hear what they're saying. I also think that they're going to be lawyering this like crazy because that's a very tricky line. So when he's talking about news we break ourselves, like again, like... When he's saying break, what he means is publish. Yeah. Oh. But also, w one of the things that people don't quite appreciate about Hunterbrook, because they haven't really got going yet, is that most of their investigations are in real news deserts. Mm. They're taking place in countries that just don't have basically any independent press at all or very, very little independent press. And so there is, like, theoretically publicly available information in these countries but no one is publishing it. And so when they're saying, 
you know, news we break. They're saying we we might well be the first people to publish this information, but it's all been available, you know, in government documents or corporate filings or something like that. It's just no one's done the legwork to find it. And I think the first, the main thing that people don't understand about Hunterbrook is that, and, the, and the, one of the reasons they don't understand about it, uh, Hunterbrook is because they've only published one story, and that one story was about an American company. But the majority of their journalism is going to be international, not U.S. So can I ask about how they're supposed to make money? Because I've read through the stories about them, but you've talked to them. You know, it, they have said, oh, we're not going to be a Bloomberg, a Barron's. You know, having worked for Bloomberg, I was very aware that my audience was perhaps trading on, say, the minute-to-minute negotiations about what the ACA bill was finally going to look like, right? Because right. there was a lot of money to be made in those tiny tweaks. Yeah. So how does Hunter Brook make their money? So there is one big way that they try to make money. And then there's some more interesting ways that they try to make money that actually might wind up being more lucrative. The the one big way is that let's say that they do a big investigation into the filings of some, you know, Indian company that turns out to have been overstating its balance sheet or something, something you know, like this. And they publish it. But before they publish it, what they do is they hand the draft of their story to their sister hedge fund. And the sister hedge fund goes, this seems like a pretty compelling story. What we're going to do is we're going to short the stock. And then when the story appears, the stock is going to fall. And then we can cover our short and we can make money. So the idea is, and this is this is a pretty well-trod business model. A lot of short, short sellers do this. They build up a short position. Then they publish their findings. After they publish their findings, the stock goes down. They cover their short. They make money. It, and that's one of the reasons that people don't like shorts, but we are not going to get into that. That was the thing that everyone thought that Hunterbrook was going to do when they first announced that they were going into business. What's super interesting about their first story, which is about a mortgage company in the United States, which looks as though it's been sort of ripping off a bunch of home buyers along the way, is that they not only shorted the stock, which doesn't seem to have made a lot of money, the stock doesn't seem to have moved all that much, but they also teamed up with some very expensive lawyers to file a class action suit against the company. Hmm. And that kind of thing, bringing class actions can be very lucrative. And so they can make money on lawsuits as well as from just trading stocks. That seems that some of that doesn't make sense to me, though, that especially, you know, if most of their reporting is going to be in markets that are kind of news deserts, a lot of those markets, most of those markets, I think, are also places where public records are not reliable. So, you know, if you're going to a market, you know, when I was an equity analyst a billion years ago, most of the people I worked with didn't want to invest in Chinese companies because they didn't think that the financial reports were reliable. Yeah. Hunterbrook is not going to be working in China. I'm I'm almost certain of that for any number. Well, okay. India. <laughs> That's the example you used. Yeah. They, I think they are going to be working in India. I guess what's what's the advantage if the only thing that they're working off of is publicly available information if publicly available information isn't necessarily reliable? So here's the thing, right? What, what we have in India and in any number of markets, and in fact, to some extent in every market, is you have a public stock market where shares are traded every day on the basis of the information that is available to traders and to investors. Sometimes that information is incredibly reliable. Sometimes that information is not. But regardless of how reliable it is, the information is what ends up guiding the share price. If you can piece together the information, you can trade on it. You can trade on it and you can say, well, hey, have a look at this. Like, you know, it might not be completely, you know, as perfect information as we might ideally want or we might have in the United States. But this is what we have managed to find out. And what we've managed to find out makes it look like the shares are much more expensive than they should be. And that is how stock trading works. Stock trading never works on the basis of perfect information. Stock trading always works on like, what do we think the most likely thing here is? And that's why a stock can go down even if you don't have everything 100% nailed down. I mean, look, I am 
I think you can color me skeptical but curious about where this all goes. It's such early days. They do have some money and they have some heavy hitters who are involved. Matt yeah, Murray. Like Matt Murray is the former editor of the Wall Street Journal. Um, some it, Emerson Collective money in there. Funding them, yeah. And in the first story about UWM, they had Bill Cohen involved. They had Bethany McLean involved. Like These are big names. Yeah, here's what it, here's one thing that I do think is smart, and it distinguishes it from something like Hindenburg. Hindenburg is speaking very specifically to usually a very professional audience, and I think whenever you productize buy side equity research in this way, and, and you know you're actually building a publication around it, you also end up talking to retail investors in a way that you probably would not be able to in, if you were just using the Hinden, Hindenburg model. And you probably get, you know, picked up more by regular business outlets. So in that case, I, I think it's a good marketing strategy in a way. I kind of take the other side of that. I don't think they care whether they reach retail investors. And I don't think they particularly care whether the public reads them that much. Like what the thing they care about is the institutions who are driving the markets, both the the narrow market of the stock market, but also more broadly, like the whole sort of edifice of SEC complaints and whistleblower complaints and class action lawsuits and that kind of thing. Because, yeah, you know, that's the other thing they're trying to do with UWM is they're trying to file a whistleblower ca- complaint with the SEC. If the SEC winds up finding the company, then they can get a third of the fine. Hmm. There's lots of ways you can make money. There are a whole way. bunch of different, right? They're like, they're looking at all these different revenue streams. And it's smart. And like, I remember writing more than a decade ago that this is a smart business model for the media. I remember the New York Times put out an investigation. Now, this was an investigation, and so this is a little bit different, but they put an investigation into Walmex, the Walmart subsidiary in Mexico, and Walmart stock dropped. I'm like, well, they knew the stock was going to drop. Why couldn't they just short the stock in advance of the story coming out? Because it's a lot more lucrative than trying to sell ads in this market. You know, I think this is the other thing that we have to remember is that in terms of media business models, the, the, the existing <laughs> ones aren't that great. No, I'm I'm laughing because the the alternative is tears, 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 tears. I tears. mean, for media business models. Yeah, I, I I don't know how scalable it is, and I am going to say that the overwhelming majority of Hunterbrook stories are going to be extremely boring and they're not going to get millions of hits and page views because most people do not care about some scandal about a company that they've never heard of but that's okay trouble is you don't realize you're talking to two people as charles foster kane who owns eighty-two thousand three hundred sixty-four shares of public transit preferred my time on the other hand i am the publisher of the inquirer Slate Money is sponsored this week by Wondery, which is the company that produces the daily news podcast, The Best One Yet. Do you want to hear about the $100 wedding dress that saved Abercrombie? Or which real tech acquisition is like Game of Thrones? Or the one financial equation that can finally solve climate change? Every morning on The Best One Yet, hosts Nick and Jack serve up three of the most interesting business news stories and why you need to know them in just 20 minutes. Be in the know this year by starting your morning with the best one yet every weekday. Follow the best one yet on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen ad-free right now on Wondery Plus. And for more deep dive and daily business content, listen on Wondery, the destination for business podcasts. With shows like The Best One Yet, How I Built This, Business Wars, and many more, Wondery means business. Slate Money is sponsored this week by BetterHelp. A lot of us spend our lives wishing we had more time, but the question that raises is time for what? If time was unlimited, how would you spend that time? The best way to squeeze that special thing into your schedule is to know what's important to you and make that thing a priority. How do you find out what's important to you? Therapy. Therapy can help you find out what matters to you so that you can do more of that thing. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It is designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire 
get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime. No additional charge. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash slate money today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash slate money. Slate Money is sponsored this week by Thorn. And Thorn is a company that helps you be in control of your health, which means being super mindful of what you put in your body. If you're the kind of person who's always trying to find the best option out there from food to supplements in terms of what you eat and what you consume, that's where Thorn comes in. Thorn takes a personalized, innovative, and scientific approach to health and wellness, whether it's their B-complex, creatine, magnesium citrate, basic prenatal. Thorn's got all the supplements you need to help promote and maintain your health goals. I myself have Daily Greens Plus, which is designed to help with your cellular health and energy production and gives you greens-based support to help provide foundational daily nutrition. Thorn is trusted by over 5 million customers, 47,000 healthcare pros, loads of pro athletes, 100 plus pro sports teams, and multiple U.S. national teams. Give your body what it really needs with Thorn. Go to thorn.fit slash money and use code MONEY for 10% off your first order. That's T-H-O-R-N-E dot F-I-T slash MONEY. Code MONEY for 10% off your first order. Thorn dot fit slash MONEY. Code MONEY. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. I'm going to break some news here. Wine is delicious, but it is also increasingly unpopular. Um, I started reading headlines from France starting a few years ago about, oh my God, the French aren't drinking wine anymore, and especially the French aren't drinking red wine anymore. I remember when red wine sales in France fell so much that they were lower than rosé sales. So the French stopped drinking wine. The Australians... Well, they lost their big export market, which was China, because they got into a fight about nuclear subs or something. I can't name it. No, COVID. They got into a fight about COVID. And the Chinese got so pissed off about what the Australian PM was saying about the Chinese origins of COVID that they stopped allowing Australia to export wine to China. Anyway, the fact is that there's just this massive glut of wine in the world, and everyone is producing too much wine, and no one knows what to do with it. Well, I don't seem to understand is why people aren't drinking it. And the the stories that we have all been reading in preparation for this conversation, a, a lot of it seems to break on age lines. Like Gen Z drinkers are not that into wine, but the spirits market is remaining decent, even though I guess overall alcohol consumption is declining somewhat. You see, I, you see, I 100% agree that Gen Z drinkers are not particularly into wine. Now, let's be clear about this. Gen Z drinkers are, what, 22, 23 years old. If you go back in history, you know, to the 70s or the 50s or whenever you want, there was never a time when 22 and 23-year-olds were drinking much wine, right? So I feel like this doesn't explain a lot. It doesn't have well, a lot of explanatory Well, except for the American power. Revolution, they were all just drunk all the time because the water was terrible. Right. Well, yeah, but that was, yes, exactly. So you need to go back quite a long time. So, so I feel like there is something else going on, and I feel like Elizabeth is going to put her finger on it. Yeah, well, it's not just 20-somethings that are drinking less. I think part of it does have to do with the overall, you know, people switching to even people who still drink, sometimes using alternative beverages to moderate drinking or whatever. And if you're that person, I just sort of imagine that you would be the kind of person who maybe once or twice a week would have a martini or a White Claw or something, but you're not invested enough in whatever liquor you're drinking tastes to develop the kind of palate or, you know, understanding you need to really be into wine or to be somebody who would drink it every day, which is the French demographic, per your statement about wine consumption being down there, now fewer than 10% of French people drink even a glass a day. Yeah, and this is my theory, which is it's actually not great, logistically speaking, to drink a glass of wine a day. Wine comes in bottles. Bottles... Yeah. 
have six glasses of wine in them. So when you open a bottle, there's a kind of implicit expectation that you're not going to drink a glass. You're going to drink six glasses because wine goes off if you leave it open too long. The thing about spirits is that it doesn't. You can open a bottle of whiskey, have a glass of whiskey, and then keep it open for the next six months, never touch it, and have and another glass, whis- glass of whiskey, and it's fine. So there is this kind of feeling of like, do I really want to uncork this bottle of wine and then put myself in this feeling of like, well, now I've uncorked it, I should drink six glasses. If not tonight, then definitely within the next day or two. I mean, hopefully not tonight. That's a big ask. <laughs> <laughs> I, so I have like a bunch of different questions. Um, one of them is whether consumers will age into wine consumption, maybe not in the same volume as in the past, but will sort of say, oh, I would like to have a nice bottle of wine in my 40s, 50s, whatever. Or if the rise in legal weed, edibles, et cetera, has taken something out of that market. Or then my next question is whether some growing understanding that alcohol is a carcinogen is having any effect here. I think the latter is a really important point because not just people understanding that alcohol is a carcinogen in in any amount, but, you know, 10 years ago, people were sort of under the impression that you could drink quite a bit of wine that would be good for you because of the reservatrol levels. And now research is coming out that says that's nonsense. I feel like... A lot of people are going to continue to believe that if it, if they you know persuade themselves that it's true. I don't think anyone particularly thought that, oh, if I drink half a bottle of wine, that's going to be good for my health. But the but I think what Lizzie is saying is absolutely true, which is that we now have a menu of options if we want to fuck ourselves up a little bit. I mean, I'm an edible girl. I do enjoy edibles. You enjoy, you enjoy edibles. I like in in if you were in California, you might be microdosing. I, I mean, I could be microdosing here in New York. You could, you could be microdosing right here, right now. I'm not, but I could be. You but, could be. but also, I just went through cancer, and so, but I also have this this little lingering thing in the back of my mind that's like, yes, I would love to have a glass of red wine. Mm, do I want to do that to my body right now? So yeah, I think th- we are becoming broadly more health conscious, and that's affecting alcohol consumption in general. Wine consumption is going down more than alcohol consumption in general. But I do think that, yeah, that that whole thing about it coming in 750 milliliter bottles does partially explain why wine would do that. And and yeah, also, it's just an acquired taste. And the other thing is that it's quite expensive compared to other forms of alcohol. And if it's easy and if it's societally acceptable to just be drinking white claws instead then yeah just do that it's sad though because wine is delicious and we love winemakers <laughs> winemakers are some of the loveliest people it's very nice i mean yeah, look felix and i had some nice wine this week we did we, lovely I, wine from italy and i will say one thing for winemakers they nearly always have very very friendly dogs go visit wineries hang out with the dogs drink the wine they're always beautiful like wine regions are always lovely and they just have great natural scen- scenery. And yeah, it's bad for you, but that's what life is all about, right? You do things <laughs> that are bad for you and then you die. It's really unfortunate. We should we should have a numbers round. Elizabeth, do you have a number? So my number is 127 and that's percent. And that's the percentage of reserves, the amount of night specialty insurance companies, reserve holdings that they are using to insure Donald Trump's bail right now. So in in theory, only 10% of their reserves should be devoted to any single bail bond. And in this case, they're they're using far more than that. And also, they're not actually registered to serve bail in New York. So Tish James is challenging it. But the number is just sort of striking. So yeah, no, the, the, the TLDR here is that a company that wasn't actually allowed to serve a bail bond in New York served a bail bond in New York, and now the Attorney General is saying, wait, you're not allowed to. And besides, you don't even have that much money. So maybe Donald Trump is going to be forced to sell some of his Truth Social shares. Yeah, and the company's owned by a guy named Don Hankey, who's a billionaire who made his fortune in some prime loans, which seems appropriate. Well, if he's a billionaire, then presumably he's good for the bond, right? I mean, if he were personally guaranteeing it. 
That Maybe. Probably be Who true. I'm, I'm sure they can come up with something. Hanky's a great name for that. Lizzie, what's your number? My number's 4.7. 4.7? Yeah, man. That's the earthquake that you and I failed to feel th- because we were standing outside the studio on a very... I don't know, solid concrete floor, not paying attention. And everybody else felt it. Everyone in New York felt it except for me and Lizzie. Except for me and Felix. We were looking at a picture of your niece's lamb. Oh my God, my my niece's lamb was so cute. This is what (laughs) happens. If you're looking at a picture of a cute lamb, then you will not feel an earthquake. I don't think it had anything to do with the concrete. The concrete would shake, but we we were just otherwise engaged in important activities. Well, so I I felt it, and I'm, I'm in a different part of Brooklyn and there was a Con Ed truck parked outside of our house. So I've lived in New York long enough that I just assumed that Con Ed fucked something up and there was an underground <laughs> explosion. <laughs> I, th- I think a lot of people in New York just assumed it was some construction or something. And then they realized, and then they, and then all of their text messages started blowing up and they're like, oh, it was an earthquake. So well done, New Yorkers, for, for surviving an earthquake. Well done, Eric Adams, mayor of New York, for leading us through this difficult time. Felix. And for sending us an emergency alert 30 minutes after the earthquake happened, informing us that the earthquake had happened. My number is $1.8 billion, which is the amount of money that South Carolina has found in a bank account. And it doesn't know whose money it is, and it doesn't know how the money got there. And it's not 100% sure that the money actually exists, but apparently... It was meant to be sitting in this bank account for just like a day or two on its way from one place to another in like 2017. And it went in and then it never went out. And it's been sitting there all along. And now South Carolina's, all of the the controllers and all the rest of it are pointing fingers at each other saying, no, it's, wait, what are you doing? This is terrible. It's 13% of their state budget of 13. It's like Schrodinger's million. state budget. Like It's amazing <sighs> that they can't tell whether it's there or That's not. That's completely insane. Who is in charge of South Carolina's money? Well, this is part of the question that there are various different state officials who are all pointing fingers at each other saying, you are meant to be in charge of this and you are meant to be in charge of this. And also there were various sort of institutional knowledge, civil service professionals who left, uh, you know, for whatever reason. And they just kind of lost track of it. And there was this bank account with $1.8 billion in it. And people just completely forgot that it exists. Good job, South Carolina. Well done, guys. You know, trebles all around. Maybe maybe they're the ones who should stop drinking wine. (laughs) On which note, I think we're going to wrap it up for this week. We're going to have a Slate Plus segment about... Disney. Disney. Yes. We're going to have a Slate Plus segment about Disney. So if you're a fan of Mickey Mouse... Do listen to that. Otherwise, many thanks to Shana Roth and Jared Downing and Merritt Jacobs for producing. Many thanks for emailing us on slatemoney at slate.com. Tell us if you stopped drinking wine. And we will be back next week with another Slate Money. When it comes to your finances, go for the credit card that's always there for you. With 24-7 U.S.-based live customer service from Discover, everyone has the option to talk to a real person anytime, day or night. Yep, that means no more waiting for, quote, normal business hours just to get a hold of someone. We're talking real service from real people whenever you need it. Get the customer service you deserve with Discover. Limitations apply. See terms at discover.com slash credit card. When we made our McDonald's spicy chicken McNuggets, you were praise hands emoji. Then we ran out, and you were streaming tears emoji. Now they're back, so you can be grinning face with sweat emoji. Order ahead on the McDonald's app. And get money mouth face emoji with two orders of crispy, irresistible 10-piece McNuggets, spicy or classic, for just $6. Limited time only. Prices and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer. Single item at regular price. ba ba ba